A good morning to you, Hillside. I'm Dan Seitz, senior pastor here at the church, and I am so happy to see every single one of you. If you have a Bible with you today, I want you to open it up to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 8 through 10. And if there are kids in the room, and I think there are, I see Eden, uh, Eden Amelie, I see Galilee Amelie, I saw some Gillis kids. If you have your Bible with you, the Bible that we Give first graders, I want you to pull it out right now, because this passage that we're going to look at today, I'm reading right out of your Bible, okay? So I'll give you a second to find it. It's on page 1426 in the Adventure Bible. If there's an adult nearby, uh, that adult can help you find it. But I encourage you, always bring your Bible to church. Good habit to get into. Again, Ephesians 5 8 through 10. Let me read it to you. It's our main passage for the morning. Listen to this. At one time, you were in the dark, but now you're in the light because of what the Lord has done. Live like children of the light. The light produces what is completely good, right, and true. Find out what pleases God the Lord. It's God's word for us this morning. Over this summer, I've shared with you two messages in which I've shared commitments that I think we need to make as a church family to realize our wonderful vision. Be light in the world. Well, this morning, before I share with you some tremendous news, I have great news for you this morning. I'm going to give you one more message in that Hugo's Notebook series to kind of finish up the trio. And this is going to be our last message like this for a while, because next week we jump into our fall series from the middle section of Luke uh, called Journey to Jerusalem. Well, in Hugo's Notebook Part 1, I shared with you my deep conviction that to realize our vision as a church, be light in the world. We need together to work at a remodel of our service culture, to to change it into something that is gift-based, team-based, and term-based. In other words, to realize our light-bearing vision here at Hillside, I think we need to unleash you, Hillside. And more particularly, to set you loose in a ministry role that matches your gifts and and draws out your very best, that places you with teammates so you never feel like you're serving alone, and lastly, one that has a definite starting point and a definite ending point. And to work towards that uh, reboot of our service culture— We introduced something called Amazing Race 22-23, which I introduced back on July 10th. And that church-wide initiative in which all of us who want to, in which all of us who are able to commit to a ministry team for the whole school year begins next Sunday, August 21st, and it will end Sunday, June 4th. And many of you have already committed to a racing team. It is amazing how God has already blessed this initiative, just like uh, Janet and Floyd's prayer team have prayed. Some teams even have already begun running. They have not waited for the crack of the starter pistol, like Mark Seaver's Yardscape team. They were out here all day, half the day yesterday, cleaning this place up, making it beautiful. And it reminds me, what a difference earnest prayer, specific prayer means for Hillside. We've been praying along these lines. God has been answering, and that's why we're kicking off the ministry year this Saturday at 9 a.m. with a prayer gathering in the multi-use room. And we together, whoever comes, we are going to pray that God pours out his goodness on Hillside in a way he never has before. We're going to pray big prayers, and I invite you to join us. It will go 70 minutes on the button. I'm quickly going to add, it's not too late to join Amazing Race 2223. 
Our website has all the ministry teams that are available. And as you can see over there on the wall, we have rosters of everybody who has committed to a ministry team for this next year. And if you're a hillside or you're a regular here, before you leave today, I want to ask you a favor. Go over and look at that roster. This is important. If it's your understanding that you've joined a ministry team this year for Amazing Race, and yet your name is not listed on that roster, you got to tell us, because we got to have a complete list. You can call Matt in the church office. Similarly, if it's not your understanding that you've joined a ministry team this year, and yet you find your name on that list, I'm sorry, you're just going to have to serve, okay? Just kidding. You call Matt and we will straighten it all out. So that was Hugo's Notebook Part 1, all about service. Hugo's Notebook Part 2, I shared with you the second commitment that I am sure that we need to make together as a church family to realize our vision. And that, you might remember, was to build up our culture of spiritual companionship. And more specifically, that means helping everyone who desires to. Because nobody gets pushed into anything at Hillside. Everyone who wants to, finding a small group. And as I've shared before and will say again, a hillside small group means something very particular. It's a group that meets for at least these three purposes. Relationship building, immersion in scripture, and consideration of the king's leading. And to make it even simpler, these three words. A hillside small group is one that meets for connection, reflection, and exploration. If it meets for those three purposes, it's a hillside small group. That small group might meet for additional purposes as well. In addition to those things, maybe it meets to do ministry. Maybe this is a team that goes out to the monument and tutors kids. Or maybe in addition to those three things, this group meets just for fun. They go hiking together or they cook together. It doesn't matter. If at its core are those three activities, friendship, deep immersion in Scripture, and consideration of how God's Spirit is leading, it is a hillside group. And you can find these groups all over Hillside. If you are a man, listen to me here, I recommend you start with Kairos or Wednesday Morning Men. Start there. If you're a woman, I recommend starting with the well or Oasis. If none of those small group habitats work for you, then I recommend you find a, a home group. And we have lots of them. They, they start September 11th. If none of those home groups work, come to the small groups team and we will work to handcraft a group for you. That's how committed we are to helping every hillsider who wants to find a group. Now, it's not hard to imagine why connection, friendship building, and it's not hard to imagine why immersion in Scripture would be important group activities, all right? But why exploration? Why is that so important? And what is that anyway? People over this last summer since I've been talking about this have been asking me, what do you mean by exploration? And by exploration, I simply mean doing what Ephesians 5.10, our passage this morning, calls us to do. It's namely with other believers discerning what is pleasing to the Lord. And to be a little more specific, it's engaging in practices that help each of us as disciples of Jesus lean into his specific leaning. And in many ways, Exploration is the most important small group activity to really zero in on because it's usually the one that gets lost in the shuffle. If you just think about home group life or group life, you know, friendship building activities sort of come naturally to us. We do that naturally. Bible study comes naturally to us, but discerning how the living God is directing each of us in the group context is a little bit less automatic. It's a little bit trickier. So two questions then for the time that remains. Why is exploration so important? Why is this critical for group life at Hillside? And second, how can we do it? How can we practice it in our groups at Hillside? Taking the first question first, why is exploration so important? Why is this key? 
Now, I can make this simple or I can make this complex. And though it's not my natural bent, let's make it simple, okay? <laughs> Exploring Jesus' particular leading in our lives is critical because the essence of discipleship is following Jesus. Over and over again, Jesus called people to follow him, to come after him. Mark 8, 34 is an example. Listen to this passage. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, Jesus said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus calls everyone, everywhere to follow him. Jesus invites every human being to come to him, to experience his forgiveness, to gain his friendship, and then to serve him as a first-class, adored member of his every skin color worldwide family. That is every human being's created purpose. The movie Hugo, Hugo and his friend Isabel, have an intense conversation about the purpose of human life. And as they muse over this question, Hugo suggests this. He says, if you have a purpose, you're broken. And I know that's true. You know, human beings, or at least most of them, they don't know their purpose. In fact, most human beings don't know that they have a purpose. But all human beings have a purpose. And our purpose is to love and serve the potter who shaped us and to bring a smile to his face through our creative service. And then you know what else? To love his fellow pots. That's why we were made. And we were returned to that purpose when we believe in Jesus when we affirm from the heart that he's the king of this world, that he died on the cross to rescue us, to forgive us, to rescue all of creation, and then to begin following him as those who belong to him, not somberly, but with expectant glee, since to belong to him is to be his heir, to be named to a spectacular new creation inheritance. Well, think about it. Following Jesus means something. It means to be alert, to be aware of his direction, and then in the power of the Spirit, doing what he directs, which we can do. Because when we believe in Jesus, we have him inside us by his Spirit. Nevertheless, being alert, being aware to how the living God, the spirit inside, the king to whom we are united is directing us, it requires intention. It requires practices. And to put it slightly a different way, Jesus the reigning king, Jesus the high priest, the one who's interceding for us right now at the right hand of God, the one who blazed a path into God's presence for us through the sacrifice of himself, this God calls us to be hearers and doers. I love this. Luke eleven twenty seven. 27. Jesus is preaching. And this woman who's in the crowd who's listening is completely captivated by what he's saying. And she yells out, blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. To which Jesus replies, instead, blessed are those who hear God's word and obey it. This has always been God's dream for his people his treasured possession people, that we would be hearers and doers. References to hearing and doing are all over the Bible. They're all over the book of Deuteronomy. In Psalm 81, the inspired poet quotes the Lord crying out this way. This is the Lord crying out in verse 13. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. Again, hearing and doing. And then the New Testament writer James picks up on that theme of hearing and doing. This is James 1.22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. And this is why small group practices of exploring God's leading are so important. Again, to be a Christian is to be a follower of Jesus. Being a follower of Jesus requires being aware of how he's leading. And being aware of his leading requires practices. And now, 
more than ever. Because the world is so full of noise, 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 to quote the great theologian, Mr. Grinch. That's right. <laughs> that brings us to our second question, how? How can we do it? How can we explore Jesus the King's leading so that we can follow so we can bear light. Or using the language of this morning's passage, Ephesians 5.10, how can we try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord? Again, we can make this simple or we can make this complex. And though it goes against every instinct, let's make it simple again, okay? A simple practice for exploration. And I emphasize simple. This is a practice that can follow the reflection phase of any hillside group wherever you find it. After we pass through the phases of friendship building, which is connection, and scripture study, which is reflection, we first do this. We close our Bibles. We close our Bibles. That's the first step in the exploration practice. Now, that's a surprise, isn't it? <laughs> you would not expect me to say that. Usually, pastors are encouraging people to open their Bibles, but think about it. Think about the group context. We've already immersed ourselves in scripture. We've already studied it carefully. We've already taken it on its own terms. We've already tried to figure out not what it means for us, but what it means. We've done that hard work, and now it's time to explore how Jesus is leading. You know, I don't know if this is a problem for you, but it can be for me. Do you know that sometimes for me, Bible reading, which I do a ton of, and love can actually be a way of evading the living God. It can be a way to get out of his gaze. It can be a way to procrastinate talking to him, listening to him, being still before him. And here's my challenge. It's a challenge to me. It's a challenge to all of us. Let's not let endless study keep us from purposeful and prayerful exploration of what the living Lord is telling us to do today or this week. We close our Bibles. What's next? We call on the triune God to come close. And by this I mean we pray that the one true God, the God who really exists, the God who is not some glum, sedentary, heavenly hermit, but rather one who exists in an eternal community, a dance of love. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three persons, one essence. We pray that that particular God would right now in this little group make us mindful of his presence. And right now he would draw close to do his directing and his transforming work. I think if you read one book on spirituality over the course of your Christian life, I think it should be a renovation of the heart by Dallas Willard. Dallas Willard was an academic philosopher at USC. He was also a world-class theologian. Luke and Jack Downing, whom I often see in Trojan swag, will be happy to hear that. He was a Trojan. Several times in his book, Willard says some variation of this statement. Listen to this. The most important factor in a church, he says, prospering in spiritual formation, fancy talk, becoming like Jesus and being directed by him. The most important factor is, he says, the teaching God, Father, Son, and Spirit in the mist. Right there. Expecting him to operate and to be present. And this should encourage us because even though transformation and direction, it requires our participation. It's the triune God who ultimately does it. And he's generous to provide it. And this practice of Ephesians 5.10 style exploration, it requires taking comfort in that ultimate reality. Third, and here's where the exploration rubber really meets the road, aware of the spirit in our midst as a little group of followers of Jesus. In a prayerful and expectant mode, we do this. We ask each other a very simple question, one that couldn't be more basic. We say, how do you sense King Jesus calling you to follow him? 
How do you sense King Jesus, who's right here with us, how do you sense him calling you to follow him? We could expand it this way. Having just soaked in his life-giving word together, thought about it deeply, taken it in on its own terms. In this holy place where the spirit is thick, how do you sense Jesus the king is directing you? And then we take a little bit of time in the group to ponder, to think out loud. How might the king be leading me? He's the king. I exist to follow him. Where is he calling me to go? And while the one thinks out loud, the others primarily listen. We don't explode forth in teaching, in speaking from on high about what we believe Jesus the living king is saying to our brother. Rather, primarily we, we listen in a prayerful mode. Maybe we ask some short follow-up questions that help draw out our fellow disciple and that maybe sort of help them stay on the course of biblical truth. But mainly, we keep those questions in our comments brief. We listen. We listen attentively. We sit with that fellow follower of the king as he or she considers the living Lord's leading in that holy, God-soaked space. Now, group composition and group size matters here. And I'll just be frank with you. Personally, I find it easier to explore Jesus' specific leading for me in a group of dudes. I just do. So often, what God is calling me to do pertains to personal things, things that I don't necessarily want to share with a gal. I want to share it with Frank or Grant or Jim or Keon. Not a rule, something to think about for your own groups. Maybe when we get to exploration, maybe we split the men and the women. Think about it. But the point, there is so much power in this simple small group exploratory practice, which any group can do. It could cap any group here at Hillside. And let me say, the possibilities for breakthroughs, the possibilities for new insights, for seeing ourselves as we really are, what some have called kairos moments are so tremendous, simply by asking the question, now, suppose our fellow disciple, when asked how King Jesus might be leading, suppose that he's coming up blank, has nothing to say, like suppose he's a man, okay? <laughs> if he's not sensing much and he welcomes it, here's what we can do as group members. We can offer a couple of simple prompts, and here's one. And in my little group of spiritual companions, this is a question I would love to be asked by Matt. Dan, is there an act of practical love that King Jesus would have you take towards someone you live with? Just that question. That's a great exploratory question because Galatians 5.14 says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So when we're trying to discern what's pleasing to the Lord, we can always ask each other this question. Is there somebody nearby, maybe somebody in your household, who needs your loving service? Start there. Here's another prompt. Is there a Jesus-like quality that you could practice or put on? Patience, love, gentleness, self-control. That's a great exploratory question because Romans 13, 14 says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ as your clothing. You know what that means? Practice being like Jesus in the power of the Spirit. And friends, it's because spiritual companionship is the occasion for those kinds of breakthroughs, those kairos moments, explosions of insight into who we are and the possibilities for our lives in the king that we are so keen this year for everybody who wants to, because nobody gets pushed into anything at Hillside. Everybody who wants to and can join a group, whether Kairos, whether Wednesday Morning Men, whether Oasis, whether The Well, whether a home group. So would you do it? 
Would you give it a chance if you're not in one? Would you take the risk that if you jump into a group, the living Lord will meet you and encourage you and direct you? Let me close with this. Like I just said, Kairos is a pillar ministry of Hillside. Really, really important ministry here because it's one of the places at Hillside, not only where you can get first-rate, comprehensive biblical instruction, which we all need, but you get a rich small group experience where you get the possibility of real Kairos moments where God's transforming and directing power breaks through. But let me ask you, do you know where Kairos itself was born? Do you know this story? Almost 10 years ago, Jack LaSalle... Pete Stafford and Pastor Jeff were meeting for spiritual companionship. They were meeting for connection, friendship building. They were meeting for reflection, immersion in scripture, and they were meeting for exploration, trying to figure out how God was leading each one of them. And as they pondered in that spirit-saturated place, and as these men asked each other, how do you sense King Jesus calling you to follow him. And as Pastor Jeff gave them some prompts, Jack and Pete had a Kairos moment. They sensed the living Lord, their king, calling them to start a men's Bible study, one in which men could connect deeply on Monday nights, live into God's word, study it in a comprehensive way. You see, Kairos one of the most important ministries at Hillside came in a small group. Kairos was a Kairos moment. One of the crown jewel ministries of Hillside was born out of three disciples engaging in spiritual companionship. And it makes me wonder what other gifts God might have to give us as we go further and deeper into spiritual companionship. I wonder what goodness could flow. So again, I'll ask, if you are able, would you consider joining a group this fall? Maybe you just dip your toe in the water. You say, I don't know about it after this fall. I'll try it for the fall. I'll see what happens. Signing up is easy. There's a link on the app. You can go to the website. You can talk to a team member. You can come into the office. We have an updated small groups brochure. We will help you find a nest. Let me pray. Father, we ask on the cusp of this new ministry year at Hillside, we ask that as we draw near to you in our groups, We pray that you would draw near to lead and to guide. For our good, for the health of our families, for the goodness of our marriages, if we happen to be a married person, for the good of our children, for the good of our neighbors, for the good of our church, for the good of the world. We pray this in Christ's name, our living hope. Amen.